All right, I think that's a little bit better. I, I was actually talking to the mute button. Uh, and it's a great way to start off talking about the future of technology and shrinking the distance because it really leads into one of my biggest points is that the only guarantee when you do something live or you try new technology is that something will go wrong. So when I kicked off talking to the mute button, we got that out of the way from the very beginning. And I'm excited because as we look at this current environment and a lot of what has been presented already at this event, we have to start imagining what that future looks like. And I'm excited because part of this imagination of the future is that we get to create the future unlike anyone else. And so with that in mind, I'm gonna get started. I don't know if you guys are ready, but let's do, uh, oh, that didn't work. Let's try one more time. Oh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna be talking to you guys about shrinking the distance and really, what does it mean for us to come through and really push the envelope with technology, social media, digital, and even the future of virtual? And it's gonna tie into some of the things that you guys have already heard throughout the presentation. But really when we start thinking about this and really where I wanna kind of go to begin with is that we have to start looking at a new way of presenting a new way of the future. And one of the things that I think where we can kind of uh, put our, our minds uh, at ease is that we have to focus on reinventing the future, not repurposing it. Much like we have to do with virtual events, it's not about repurposing something from offline to online, rather it's how do we reinvent the experience? And one of the things that I think we, we oftentimes have a difficulty with, especially with the screen, especially with the fact that we have these, we're, you know, we're, we're all around the world, unfortunately not all in the same place, is that we, when we're thinking about reinvention, oftentimes we try to bring the offline limitations with us online. For example, why do we have to have screens when we can have video cameras and lighting and audio and allow ourselves to use things like overlays, which you see that I'm using here, right? So it's the idea is, you know, I speak at about 60 events a year uh, around the world um, on stages and I miss the stages, but I think it's important to think about how do we transform into the future? How do we move things forward? And where I think we can start is that we have to leave offline limitations offline. And what I mean by that is when you start thinking about, okay, what role does technology play? What role does virtual play? We have to look at the offline experience and remove the mechanics, remove the mechanics of that offline experience and focus only on the experience itself. What is it that we are delivering? I've now done over 60 virtual events since March 30th and my world got flipped upside down. And one of the, the things that I found really interesting in the virtual space is that when we are open to reinventing what this looks like, well, you get an event like this one where we're, we're thinking about different ways of bringing in different uh, teams. And I love Karina's you know, concept of not only were different teams doing different things, but they're pushing different envelopes and trying different things as they go. And so this to me has been something that's been rooted in everything that I've done. And so um, as you might be able to see here, um, I, I deployed cybersecurity tools uh, to the Department of Defense. I did three trips to Iraq, four to Afghanistan. Um, my goal was to deploy cybersecurity tools into these different environments and then ultimately help the different branches of the military embrace this new technology. And I was also in charge of what I believe was the hardest collaboration job in the world. My job was to get the Army to share cybersecurity policies with the Navy get the Air Force to share with the Marine Corps. And it opened up my mind to all kinds of things. And, and then I left and went to the data center and I, and I really went after my dream job, which was a technology evangelist modeled after what Guy Kawasaki had done at Apple. And you know a lot of what I've done now, which you can see here in the corner, is I have a five camera set up in my environment and I'm really trying to not only deliver new things, but also push the limits on where we can go with technology, where we can go with, the, with everything that we're doing. And then I'm also a dad of three girls, and so I've learned things there. And so for me, what happened back in March as we got shut down, I had a lot of people come to me and say, Brian, you must be so excited that everyone's going virtual and digital and everyone's moving online. And I wasn't excited, of course, because how can you be excited during a pandemic? But even more importantly than that, I've wanted people to find the synergy 
between technology and humanity. And there's one thing I've learned that if we force people to change, change is a lot harder to be adopted. Change is a lot harder for us to see the possibilities. And so throughout this presentation, that's my goal. My goal is to get you to look at this idea and say, how do we reinvent? How do we repurpose? But ultimately I want you to think about a new mindset, a new possibility. And we might've heard this you know, in, in many different talks where we talk about working smarter, not harder, right? Like anyone can work, work hard, but those that have found success have figured out the balance of working smarter. But interestingly enough, we don't talk about technology that way because I believe part of the issue with how we look at technology, how we look at social media, even how we look at virtual is that we too often look at technology for technology's sake rather than figuring out how can we use technology smarter so that we can do the things that we as humans do best. And so, yes, we have lots of possibilities. Yes, there's lots of things and, and ways that we can truly engage and push the envelope. But we do have to look at this and say, what does this all mean? How do we leave those limitations offline? And even more so, how do we push this into a new environment? Now, I'm a very optimistic, positive person, especially even um, as a digital futurist. But one of the things that I want us to think about is that there are technology and automation that are doing bad things. And, you know, there are users that are up to things that you might not, you know, be, be positive. But you can't prevent bad people from doing bad things. And the hard truth that I learned a long time ago is that you can't fix stupid. And what I mean by that is the number one failure, the number one security issue in the government, in companies, is not... A foreign, uh, a foreign country hacking us. It's not the technology failing. It's actually us, the human. The human making a mistake either you know, on purpose or without us knowing, sharing a password or doing something that way. And so when we, we oftentimes look at technology or new things and we're, we only focus on the bad stuff. And, I, and I, would, I would make the argument that every innovation has the ability to do something for you know, for bad or can do something to hurt others. But if we focus more on the possibilities, the use cases, what is possible in the things that we're doing, I believe we can push this forward, right? And so you can't stop the rate of change or unplug life. But the question we must ask ourselves, and this is what I hope everyone that, that, that's watching here live, I do see your chat question, your chat up there, is tech, social media, digital, making the world a bad place. Do you feel that tech is and social media and uh, digital is making a, a bad place? Or is technology, digital, social exposing the fact there's been bad people doing bad things for far too long and been getting away with it? And this is where I think we are in an intersection as a world, as a culture, where we look at technology and innovation. Because we have two options right now. We can decide to blame technology, blame TikTok for, for things that, that's going on there or explain, you know, oh my goodness, it's, you know, virtual, you know, it's these virtual platforms that are the problem. Or we can realize that we need to fix ourselves, that we have to be the ones that make the change. We have to be the ones that fix what we do. And then we can allow technology, digital and social to really push us to a new possibility, allow us to do things that we never imagined before. And so this is where I think that mindset must shift. And, and, and this is something that's important to me, but it's also something that I factored in with my daughters. And I, and I might've mentioned I'm a dad uh, of three girls. I'm a proud dad of three girls. Uh, and this is their, I, I had them make an emoji. So they each have uh, their emoji. We have uh, my Logan, my six-year-old on the far side there. Uh, I have Kinsley, my nine-year-old in the middle. And then my 10 year old right here next to me, uh, Chloe. And so what I'm going to do for this part of the presentation is I would love you guys to help me tell the last story that I'm going to tell. And so the, the three different pieces that I'm going to talk about here is my youngest daughter talks a lot about Netflix and all the ideas that she can watch anything she wants, anywhere she wants. And I want to relate what that means. What does this on-demand world mean? How does this all work in our current environment? And so the first story, that if you pick Logan, um, will be about how, does, how do we have to rethink what this on-demand world looks like? The second story is, uh, is really about my middle daughter, who's, of course, 
actually in the other room because we had a uh, a little curveball thrown at us last night uh, with a family uh, emergency. Um, and so there, she's virtual learning right now in her environment. And virtual learning is not easy. And if you are a virtual parent and you have a kid at home while you're also working, I, I tip my hat to you. It is not an easy job to be a, a teacher, a principal, a parent, and do your, your actual job. But one of the things that we have to look at and one of the things that we have to think about in this is, what, what, how can we set up our environment for success? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my middle daughter and what she said. And then the last one here is what my oldest has found out, well, with this green screen behind me. And really the, the magic that is technology and video communication. And so while we're in the chat, I would love to see those that are watching here live. I want you to decide if you want to, oh, we're gonna, here we go. We're gonna go, we're gonna go A, B, or C. So we're gonna do um, A for Logan, which was talking about the example for Netflix or what this on-demand world means. We're gonna do B, which will be the story about what my what we're learning about creating a virtual learning environment at home. And then C, what is this new possibility around us that we have at our disposal thanks to video and technology and everything that's out there. So that, that to me is something that we have to kind of think about and you know really push the envelope. Uh, and so hopefully you guys will pick. I will look at the, the chat. I see a couple of votes for A that are coming through there. So we have A, uh, you know, the youngest always gets that, right? I'm the oldest, I'm, I'm the oldest of three boys. So we have a whole bunch of A's and, and really what this on-demand world looks a lot. I do see some B's. Look at that, I love it. Keep that engagement going. All right, I'm gonna see all the, keep those comments coming. We do have some C's coming in, uh-oh. Chloe is coming in strong. It's probably funny. My daughters are on the other side of the house. They probably uh, can hear me talking about them. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. That's the question. That's the story I'm gonna tell at the very end of my presentation. So that's the, that's the hook to keep you around uh, to see which one of those stories um, I actually talk about. And so as we look at this, and this is something that with my kids and and, and as we look at the future, one of the things that we look at is we have to look at our shifting our mindset to change our perspective. I think for too often, when we look at technology or social media or digital, we try to change our perspective of the future. How, what does the world look like with these kids that are all you know, stuck in their phones? And you know, I wish we could go back to the, the days of the pager. Yes, this is a pager. Uh, I call myself a pager wearing millennial because I was born in 1981. I did have a pager in school. I know what a pager is uh, because most people assume Millennials were born on um, on the, their iPhone or born on social media, but no, I did have an I, uh, I, I, a pager. But one of the things that I think we have to look at and how we have to approach these new possibilities is we have to first focus on shifting our mindset before we can have a fresh perspective to see what is possible with technology and innovation. And so this comes down to what I call the three T's: trust, training and technology. The three T's that I believe are the most important for us looking at an innovation, looking at technology, and really trying to push things to a new level. And now, interestingly enough, this might not sound you know, mind blowing, like, okay, Brian, trust, training, and technology. But what I wanted to tell you is that it's actually the order of these three that is the most important. When I was deploying cybersecurity tools in Iraq and Afghanistan, or in Japan and Korea, or one of the 54 countries I did in four years, one of the biggest things about it was, Brian, how do we get somebody to, to embrace something new that they have no choice in, but we need their cooperation to be successful? Has anybody else had that? I, I, those that are, right? We've all had that part where we realize that we have to think differently. We have to change the way we're doing things. But oftentimes we're, we're, we're pushing against someone that is, is pushing us back or we're, we have people that, that don't want to adapt. And I will tell you, most of the innovation and technology frustration comes in, not in the technology failing, not in innovation, not holding up to what it should be, but it's actually our strategy on presenting innovation and technology to those that we want to embrace it. And so the first T, which is trust. And when I talk about trust, when it comes to adoption and shrinking the distance, it's more than just trusting, uh, having a trusting culture, right? And remember, just because you, know, you let everybody work from home doesn't mean you have a great culture. It's really that, that universal trust. And part of the thing with trust has to be, do, trust, do people trust 
the people in the decision-making process to, to select the right innovation and know what makes the most sense? Does our community trust that there is a plan to be successful with using this technology or using this innovation? And then is there a process for us to continue to evolve? Because one of the things that I learned, especially in the cloud computing world, I was a, a technology evangelist with a data center company and we were helping companies move into the cloud. I know it sounds super sexy, I know, right? But what, one of the things that we found was that the people would understand what's going on, but they, but because we live in this cloud computing world, people would assume that technology could fix everything. And, and I'm guessing lots of people that are watching now, right? We've, we've downloaded an app or a piece of software. And my favorite is collaboration, right? We'll, we'll, we'll install Slack and we'll deploy it to our whole team. And we're like, okay, everyone needs to collaborate. Everyone needs to share. And all of a sudden we realize like nobody's collaborating and sharing. And, and what do we do? What do we do in that scenario? We blame the technology. We're like, you know what? Slack is the problem. Let's remove Slack and let's add a new technology because we can just download it. Like, let's just download and install it. Well, now we're using Google Classroom and now we're, we're using Google Classroom and we're having the same problem. And probably we do it the same thing again. Like, oh, it's these technology, it's it's Zoom. It's the, okay, let's, let's, let's install something new, right? And we install the third piece of technology. It's not usually until then that we have the aha moment that it's not, the, the common variable isn't actually the technology, it's the way that we're going about deploying it. And we haven't built that trust, not only with our organization, but we haven't built the trust to be able to adapt, scale, and implement. The second T is training. And training, I think, is, a, is an interesting one because it's probably the most important, but also probably the, the least funded one of this entire environment. And when I say training, here's the thing where I want us to remember. We do not need to be training the blocking and the tackling and the buttons that we need to click. Because I don't know about you guys, but I went to YouTube University for just about everything in my environment. Just about everything, right? So I don't, I'm not very good with cars, but I love, I'm a Jeep Wrangler driver. I love my Jeep. But I needed to change a power steering pump. I cannot do anything in cars, but I watched a YouTube video and was able to change that power steering pump. And so the idea that we're living in a time that we can learn anything, any, anywhere, it doesn't mean that we need less training. It actually means we need to change what we're training on and how we're training. And so some of the key things that I work with with groups is that we have to create an environment that allows us to test, tweak, and repeat. Another piece of this is that we need to create swim lanes, not rules. We don't need to create rules on what people can do. Rather, we need to create swim lanes. And what I mean by swim lane, like a, a swim lane in the pool, we have to give people the freedom to try different things, but we still have to give them boundaries. Because if you just tell somebody, use this technology for anything you want, what happens? We freeze, we're like locked, oh my, I don't know where to start. What is this all about? But if we are able to think about this differently and we give someone the Swim lanes. We tell them, this is what you can't do. These are some ideas of what I want you to do. These are some things you stay away. It allows that creativity and freedom. Third one there is document and iterate. And iterate in the sense of nothing is actually complete. I usually have two rules when it comes to this. And the first one is that perfection is a fairy tale. And the second one is that control is an illusion. You can't control what happens outside of yourself. And you have to kind of embrace that. And then the last one, and I, and I love that Karina said this um, during the open remarks. She said, you know, you don't know what you don't know and you have to figure it out. And the only way we're gonna know what we don't know and be able to innovate and try new things in this new environment is if we're willing to try it. And if it works, we can lean into it. If it doesn't work, well, now we need to re-examine what that means. And so that's the second T, which is training. And then the third one is the technology. And I loved the landing page and the introduction here um, at Planet IMAX because it's very creative. It's very, you know, it's really down to earth, but it's also, it has the instructions for us to not be overwhelmed. You know, I, I'm a big fan of artificial intelligence, augmented reality and virtual reality. But one of the big problems with those technologies is that the adoption curve is too hard. We don't know where to start. Do I need the gear? What technology do I need? Do I need to do I need to put a headset on? Like, do I where where does this all go? Right? Like, how, how do who who has this? Who doesn't? And so one of the things we have to think about when it comes to this technology is that how are we educating people? And I thought this was great on the landing page here for Planet IMAX. 
There was a plus sign, if you guys saw, which allowed us to know that there was some kind of action there. There was words above the, the actual um, different pieces that you could click. It would pop up and tell us that you could move your mouse and you can move things around. All of these things are extremely important when it comes to uh, technology because I think we too often think, okay, just because we can download it and install it means it should work. But here's my argument, is that if you haven't built trust, trust in the process, trust in your people, and you don't have a process to train people to roll with the punches and to adapt and to learn things new and be creative, it doesn't matter what technology you have. That technology will never solve the problems you need or push to do the things that you were hoping it to do. And so where I want us to think is, okay, if my mindset is open that I need to be able to build trust, training, and technology, right? Trust, training, and technology being so important. Well, now what does that mean? How do I get this new perspective? How do I push this into new ways? And so I believe we can shift this perspective by looking at it and saying, not how can I do what we used to do, but what are the new experiences, the new possibilities, the new limitations? But also, what can I do new that, that can really solve a problem? Because if you think about it, Uber and Lyft did not invent the idea of calling a car, a car coming to pick you up. What they did was they simplified it. They gave us mobile. For me, when I was traveling, I've been to 76 countries. And when I was working with the government, as soon as we were able to have shared rides and my receipts were be able to be tracked, you know, sent directly to my boss. And also from a security perspective, my, my company could know where I was taking my rides in foreign countries. My ability to navigate, my freedom to explore, my ability to travel to countries that maybe I had never would have thought I would have been, like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, you know, I've been to every country in the Middle East, there's the, I, which is my favorite region in the world. There, it's the idea that we have to be open to what's possible, the idea that we can open our mind to what's the creative options. And so where I look at this is I believe limitations inspire creativity. So when we force the work from home, and I know for many of us in March, you know, I lost uh, 18 speaking gigs and all six of my full-time clients uh, back in that first week of March, March 10th to March 18th. And it was frustrating and upsetting and disruptive. But those that were able to adapt, those that were able to try new things, we were able to look at it and say, okay, I understand that this isn't normal and I don't know how long this is going to go on. But I do believe that I can try new things and I can explore because the part of the issue that we have with technology and innovation is that we're not, we're not willing to try. We're not willing to open because most of the time we will not adopt to something new until we're able to push something different. So where I want you to think about this is how do we shift that perspective? How do we push this to a new level? How do we adopt in a new way that we really never have before? And so I think, you know, as I look at this, as we kind of pull this all into one thing, we also have to think about this in this new virtual environment. And so what I will tell you is that with the idea of limitations inspiring creativity, these are my four things that I believe that we have to kind of look at and adopt. And that is we have to define success. We have to track our goals. We have to celebrate wins. And then this is maybe my favorite one right here. We need to screenshot awesomeness. And what I mean by that is every time something good happens when you're trying something new, take a screenshot of it, document it. Because here's what happens. We too often spend all of our time upset or dwelling on the bad things that happened or what possibly could go wrong. And not a tough time celebrating our wins or documenting what is good that has happened. And so when you screenshot the good things that are happening, you're able to go there and document that and really embrace that as we move forward. All right, so I, I promised you guys, uh, before we jump into the questions, I promised you guys um, that we I have my three daughters, uh, uh, Anna Moses here, and I, I believe A1, uh, which was the on-demand uh, concept, right? This idea of you know the on-demand world and really what does this all mean now? And the, and the place I will start with this is that Here's the thing that we have to think about. And, and I was raised, my, my, parent, my, my dad raised me and my mom that, that good people are doing good things and you need to let your work do the talking for you. And there is a power in the handshake. And it's important to embrace who you are and be proud of what you're all about. 
Here's the scary part. All of that is true except for the first part. If you are waiting and letting your work do the talking for you, you are going to be drowned out by the noise of social media, video, technology, and everything else that's going around. It is up to us to tell our story, to put ourselves out there. I firmly believe there are an amazing amount of people that are great people doing great things. But right now they are drowned out by the bad news, the fake news, the corona news, the you know drama. I live in DC, Washington, D.C., the drama here in Washington, D.C. for us in the United States. But if we shift our focus and focus more on the good people doing good things, You'd be amazed of what's possible. And so when I looked at when I was talking to my youngest daughter, Logan, about all of these things and this idea of, Daddy, why are you sharing this on social media? But then at the same time, she would say, well, how do these people get on YouTube? And how are the people that are there? The piece that I want to kind of uh, tie this in for everyone that, that is watching, and I think this will kind of wrap a bow on this entire concept, is that where we're at right now is that Nothing we do, no virtual experience will replace the offline experience. No social media, no strategy will replace a handshake. A handshake will always defeat a, a, a social media. Offline events and offline meetings will always be superior than a virtual event. But if we are will, willing to reimagine what's possible, reinvent using the 360 degree environment around us, we have the ability to create new experiences. Or what I like to say when it comes to social media and digital is it gives us the opportunity to not replace the handshake, but turn handshakes into hugs and selfies. And what I mean by that is when we connect, when we share our stories, when we understand that technology does not fix people problems, we must fix the people problems first, and then technology will help us scale, help us adapt, that is where the magic happens. That is how we push forward. And ultimately, that is where I believe we shrink the distance between us and those around us. We should not be limited by where we are or the screens in front of us. Rather, we should figure out ways to extend these so that we can focus on what we are good at and allow technology to do the things that, well, that we can only dream of. Great session, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, my main emotion listening to you was embarrassment that the pre-session communication that you and I did, I was tying a note onto a pigeon and sending it to you. Um, I'm not particularly technical, um, but the great thing is that our audience are. You've got the perfect audience here of event professionals, people who are grappling. They've got a big challenge in their world at the moment because we want to meet as an industry um, I work in this area face to face, human interaction face to face. Yep. It powers this industry. It's the meetings and events industry. Technology, thank goodness it exists. It's allowing um, to extend what where live experiences, but right now it is the experience as you are showing us right now. But they will have lots of questions and already have got lots of questions about using technology within the, um, the business events world. So I'm gonna quickly do a call out to people watching. Please get your questions, not via the live chat, but via the Q&A um, section and Slido in the, the, blue, um, the blue tab. Please put your questions through. I'll see them to my right and I'll John, put them I through. Can I jump in on that, that your comment that you, you kind of kicked off with? Because it's it shouldn't be embarrassment. And I think that's the one of the things that's interesting is, and, and the reason is, is that for the last 10 years, there's a reason that virtual has not had an impact on the meetings and conference industry, right? Because we've been, we haven't really given it the attention, the love, the focus, the priority, the, the financial um, you know, ideas. And so when I look at a lot of this, it's not as much of we've been doing things wrong or we haven't been open enough up until now. It's now that we are here, how can we leverage all the experience that we have to look at these new possibilities, right? And I think this is kind of that beauty of, of, what, of your, what your comment said was that you know, when we think about what's possible, we can't look at it and say, I had to be wrong to be able to embrace something new. Rather, what did we do that was so great that we can now do even better thanks to technology? And this is where I love, like, I mean, my, I've worked with some really boring brands and helping them tell stories and put things out there. But when it comes to events and meetings and speakers and, and production teams, 
they love what they're doing. And so for me, a lot of this isn't, hey, you have to throw away everything you've done or you need to, you know, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? It's okay, let's, let's identify all the great things you've been doing, strip away the mechanics and then figure out the role technology plays. And so I, I feel you on that. I understand that. But I also believe we're at a point now where the possibilities are endless if we're willing to invest the time. Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. I think um, I'll try and summarize the two or three of the questions. A lot of it's about adoption. You mentioned yourself, the adoption curve is low. And meeting professionals of the planners, you know, they're, they're, they're busy people. There's so much on their plates. They need to be specialists in so many different areas. And of course, they bring in suppliers from AV and techno technological companies to do that. But you mentioned the adoption rates low. And I think there is a um, feeling within the industry, the people I speak to, that it's daunting because it's not always been done the best way, but the way conferences and business events have been created traditionally has been relatively the same for yep. 20 years not and that's not a positive keynote speaker breakout keynote speaker lunch you know and, and the industry itself knows that that isn't the, the future really but then just how to change being in, in, uh, in innovative adopting these all these new ideas at this time it's been seven months since covid and there's so many options and i think from the questions um i'm seeing there's there's, there's a um, a worry about that, Brian. I think there's a, yeah. there's a people are, are intimidated by that. And I, and I think one of the things that is good to remember in this arena is that because the adoption curve is is lower, doesn't mean it's easier to implement. And it's almost like this idea of like because everyone has a phone and can create video. I mean, we've seen Facebook Live. If you've seen a face, I mean, the I love like the power of live video is that anyone can go live. The reason most live video sucks. Sorry, it's true is that anyone can go live, right? And it's it's very much like that idea where we have to look at it and say, how do we reframe this entire perspective so that we can adopt? And, I, and I'll use a quote from one of my favorite movies, uh, What About Bob uh, with Bill Murray, of those that have seen it. It's baby steps, right? I think we too often, this was something that in the government, and I use this as a great example, we were securing machines inside of the Pentagon here in Washington, DC. And one of the things that we were we were working on was, okay, we have a six character password and we need to fix the password. And so much like everything, we're like, oh, we need to change everything. So we created a, a 30 character password with no word that was in the dictionary, no three letters together. It had to be numbers, letters, and characters. And we deployed this 30 character password. And the funny thing about it was we were less secure with that 30 character password than we were with the actual six character password. And why is that? because everyone, the, the password was too complex that people wrote it down on a sticky note and put it underneath their keyboard. And so all of a sudden, this idea of going all in and forcing drastic change actually made things worse, not better. And so that's where I think we as a, you know, especially in the, the event and management, for me, I love it. You know, for me, speaking is such a, a an amazing opportunity. I, I like to say, my mom likes to say I was born talking and I always talk fast. But I think when we look at where we're at, there was the early, you know, let's say up until June, we were still trying to figure out what all this meant. We were treating virtual much like a band-aid. Like, let's just keep doing this until the, we get the events back in the fall or so we can travel. And I think where we look at all of this is that, okay, let's not, let's not, let's not fault us for the first four months of treading water and just throwing things at the wall and figuring out what sticks. But let's look at our strategy. I, I said this earlier, and I think this might be one that I glossed over a little bit. We must define success first before we deploy any technology. Because here's the funny thing about technology. If you don't decide what success is like, what, what, what your vision of success is before you, de you deploy the technology, you actually let the technology decide what success is. And that's not a good thing. And so one of the things that mistakes and one of the things I think we can make in this industry is it's not about, okay, I need to go virtual. I need to do this. It's why am I going virtual? What is the experience like? Like, do I, you know, one of the things I like to say is how can we reinvent every aspect, right? Like, does it need to be multiple days in the same week? Does it need to be multiple hours in the same day? What is the role of an, an MC? What is the role of production? I, you know, I love that that was part of the conversation earlier is that we're figuring out like the importance of video, importance of great audio, uh, you know, having good Wi-Fi connections. And so these are things that I think we have to look at, but I do believe it's about baby steps forward and understanding that, 
if you're trying to fix it all or go, you know, virtual is going to solve everything, you're going to fail miserably. But if you're willing to take the steps to find success, map out the goals that you believe that you want to accomplish, and then find the technology and strategy that makes the most sense, I believe that's where we continue to iterate, we continue to test, and while we get to try, you know, new things and, and you know, create new possibilities. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, thank you, Brian. A lot of the things I took myself in notes was about mindset. Um, yeah, mental. I want to get practical, Brian. You have yep. obviously you don't have these questions; they're coming in. But this is a practical bunch that are charged with creating events, virtual, hybrid, in real life. Doesn't matter. First question, and I put you on the spot. This has been upvoted a huge amount. Any recommendations for ROI and exhibitor engagement in virtual? Um, they're on their, this, the speaker, the, so the question is on their fourth conference, the virtual conference, and exhibitors are falling. Exhibitor, exhibitor numbers are falling because they don't like virtual. Now, that's not going to be experience across the board, but any recommendations for exhibitor uh, engagement in virtual? So we're talking specifically exhibitions, not conferences now. All right, so I love this. I love this. And I think when we're looking at exhibitions, we're looking at sponsors. Here's the thing. When, when in back in March, whenever the whole thing got flipped upside down and I realized that events weren't ready to hire speakers, I got on the phone and I called 31 of the sponsors that, that I've been to in events that I became friends with. And I was asking questions like, okay, if you're not being able to go to expos or, or exhibits, you're not able to go to conferences, you're, you're, you're stuck where you're at, what are the things that you're missing? And oftentimes they would be like, I'm not really sure. And so I would reframe it and say, well, what are the things that you wanted to accomplish from an event or an expo or a conference? And sometimes they would be like, well, it's leads or it's data or sales or it's FaceTime or maybe it's just bringing the team together. And so that's where I actually think we have to start. I don't believe exhibition. I don't believe that they don't like virtual. They don't understand the role of virtual. And I believe we have to, we have to almost check ourselves. We have to look back and say, what was the actual things that we were accomplishing as an exhibitor? What, what, was, what was the true takeaways? What were the things, because when we hear that word ROI, you want something tangible, right? You want like, give me a tangible result. But is that tangible result word of mouth? Is it the ability to connect with other um, exhibitors? Is it to find people to collaborate with? I think we have to, don't tell me, don't, let's not talk about virtual. Let's reframe this. What are, the, what are the five things that you want to accomplish as an exhibitor? Let's outline those five things. And here's my guarantee. I can almost guarantee I can accomplish four of those five things in a virtual experience if you're willing to be creative. And that means, you know, if you have a step and repeat in the background, right, like of, of a virtual uh, event, having different brands, you know, maybe for the, the speakers, maybe for the expo hall, right? One of the things that oftentimes happens is that there's not engagement because we aren't committed. I don't believe, I mean, some virtual events are very boring and very disconnected, but even a great virtual event with an audience that doesn't commit the time to experience it will never be great. And I think this comes down to putting the onus on the actual audience. And so my tangible piece of this is, I want you to figure out those five things. I want us to reinvent what, the, what it can be done virtually, but here's the, here's the magic. You must educate your audience before the actual event, before the expo, on what the expectations are. If you want them to engage or come on video, you need to make sure you put it out there first. You need to tell them, hey, I need you to be in front of your computer. I need you to block off your calendar. Don't put me on tab 149 and be chasing your kids, making lunch and answering email, right? Because the thing that we are missing so much in offline experiences is our commitment and our dedication to being there. Most people from a virtual perspective are doing 30 things. I'm not going to even ask the audience that's watching right now because they probably have us on a different tab. But I think that's a big piece. So I, I think when, when, I, when I hear an exhibitor tell me they hate virtual, I'm like, good, okay, let's throw out virtual. What are five things that you're missing that you want to accomplish? What are five things that you are really lacking that we can't do, we haven't been able to accomplish virtual? And I'm going to guess some of them aren't even going to give you five. But those that are, then it's up to us to get creative. How do I... How do I integrate that into our sessions? How do I you know, give people a reason to show up? I mean, this is another one of those great examples in virtual is that I don't believe everything should be live. If it is live, it should be live for a reason. 
But if it's, if it's not going to be interactive or what I call participatory, allowing the audience to be a part of the conversation, then it shouldn't be live. It should be pre-recorded because mm -hmm. live comes with all kinds of additional risks. And so that's where I would go with that. I believe, you know, it's funny now of those 31 different uh, vendors that I had called, a lot of them are coming back to me with some great ideas of ways that we can collaborate. And I think part of this comes into a lot of them would tell me, well, we've just done events for the last 10 years. Like, I'm not even really sure what we've been getting out of it. And, and now it's a question of, okay, well, now we need to define success, set some goals, and then figure out ways to get creative. Fantastic. Listen, we're tight on time, but ask, you can keep the answer to about about less than two minutes if, if we can, I simply because of time. We've got to wrap up by the top of the hour. And um, this question, the next one's been unvoted, is about inclusivity. And it's funny, when there's live events, there's a group of people who don't like going to them because they're introverted or they will classify themselves as more introverted. They don't like networking in a business environment. Then you go online, technology, virtual, and there's people who don't like that so much because there's not the face-to-face -face contact they can't connect. So you're never going to please everybody or, or be able to create a, a perfect solution. But have you got any tips for how to use technology or technology you've seen that has uh, got the aim of being more inclusive to the widest possible audience? Yes, I love this one. I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting with Zoom and everybody getting on video is that most people are like, oh my gosh, Brian, everyone's on video now. Everyone's going to feel like, you know, video is everything. And I think what we are learning is that people are realizing that like, Zoom fatigue is because we're doing bad video or using video conferencing when we should just be a phone call or an email. But we're also realizing that video isn't just something that's easy to do. You just press a button or it's what the kids are doing. It takes work. And along with that, like in that entire concept is, okay, what is, where can we move all of this forward and understand, okay, if, if these are the, the different environments that we're living in and we have to, we have to adapt to everyone, we shouldn't force everyone to be on video. Rather, we should give them that ability to, to consume the way that they want to. And so I'm seeing some really cool things with, hey, if you want to do a networking event, you can use an avatar rather than using your video. Uh, if you don't want to be on video, but you want to have that dialogue, why not do audio to audio communication, right? There are some ways that we can think about differently. There's also the ability to, hey, like, like even on Zoom, they've now turned off, you can actually turn off your own camera. Right? So if you don't like looking at yourself, you can still be on camera, but turn off that own camera. And so I think, you know, giving people the option, I think that goes from how we network to how we consume. If this, com if the, the, if the session is, is something that someone doesn't need to be in front of a computer with, give them the option to listen to it at podcast style. If someone doesn't need to, uh, doesn't have to watch it live, give them the option to download it or get it in PDF form. I do believe we have to think with this on-demand mindset. Thank you, Brian. A uh, couple of things. First of all, a shout out to your website, please. Sure, uh, brianfanzo.com. I got a whole bunch of virtual uh, event resources up there. Um, and if you wanted to look at you know those graphics and things that I were doing, uh, I'm using Prezi Video, and I have a whole page dedicated to that. Um, they're not a partner or anything. I just Googled upon them on March 30th uh, and started using them. So yeah, brianfanzo.com, and then I'm iSocialFans on every single social network. So you pick a social Thank network, you. I'm there. Thank you very much. And I know you mentioned to me beforehand that the questions we have, you haven't managed to uh, answer. You will do a quick video. You mentioned that. Is that all right? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. So for everyone that asked, uh, asked a question that I didn't get to answer, I'll do a, a video later on today answering all of those. And we'll make sure to get that out to the audience. Brian, thank you for such an energetic, informative session. Um, it's a pleasure to have had you on. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and I will say to everybody now, um, enjoy the rest of the next uh, five hours of Planet IMEX day three. See you at a session later on in the day. Take care.